Welcome to this episode of the Wars of the Roses podcast, entitled William de la Pole, the most despised man in England. As the sun rose on the morning of the 2nd of May, 1450, it revealed a grisly sight on Dover Beach. A headless body lay on the sand, dried blood staining the butchered neck. Beside the body, atop a stake, the vacant eyes of William de la Pole, first Duke of Suffolk, stared out over the sea where he had met his fate, a fate that many felt he deserved. His family had risen from humble beginnings, a fact that had contributed to the odium that had caused those of more noble families to turn their noses up at them. From such a height, the fall was devastating. In the mid-14th century, William de la Pole, great-grandfather of this duke, was a successful and wealthy wool merchant, lending money to the crown under Edward III. His sons enjoyed much favour at the court of King Richard II, the eldest, Michael, becoming Chancellor in 1383, and being elevated to the peerage as Earl of Suffolk in 1385. Michael's younger brother Edmund served in the prestigious position of Captain of Calais. The family star was in the ascendant, but was closely aligned now with that of King Richard II. As his popularity plummeted, Michael took the brunt of the hatred as a figurehead of his government. Criticising God's anointed king was not an option, and so his closest advisers must take the wrath of a nation. In 1387, the Lord's Appellant accused him of treason, and before the merciless Parliament sat in February 1388, Michael fled to Paris, where he died the following year, aged about 60. Michael's son, another Michael, father to our Duke, was 22 when his father died, and found himself without lands and the titles which his father had been stripped of. He was more closely aligned to the Lord's Appellant, which left him out of favour with Richard II. He fought for the restoration of his lands and properties over the years that followed his father's death, finally being restored as 2nd Earl of Suffolk in 1398, shortly before Richard II fell. Although Michael heeded the Duke of York's call to arms to defend the kingdom from Henry Bolingbroke, he eventually embraced the cause of Henry IV. As a part of Henry V's campaign in France, Michael died of dysentery in September 1415 at the Siege of Harfleur, not yet 50 years of age. Michael had been blessed with five sons and three daughters, but the king's efforts in France were to decimate his family after claiming his life. His oldest son, yet another Michael, had travelled to France with his father and was one of the few notable English casualties at the Battle of Agincourt. Aged only 19, he had been 3rd Earl of Suffolk for only a month before his death. William de la Pole became 4th Earl of Suffolk on his brother's death. His other brothers were all to perish over the next two decades in France. Alexander was killed in 1429 at the Battle of Jargo, the first encounter with a resurgent France led by Joan of Arc. John died a prisoner in France in the same year and Thomas perished while acting as a hostage for William. When he returned to England, William grew ever closer to the meek and peaceable Henry VI. By this time, William was nearing 40 and had been fighting in France for most of his adult life, almost 20 years. It would be interesting to know what this old soldier thought of his king, son of the Lion of England, but described as a lamb with an acute distaste for war. Whatever their differences, Suffolk grew close to the king and, as his grandfather had done, he was soon to find his fortunes all too closely tied to a failing king. Suffolk's first major contribution to English politics was to organise a marriage for King Henry VI in 1444 by which time the king was 22. Suffolk selected Margaret of Anjou in a match that was to cause outrage. The king's uncle Humphrey was dismayed that he intended to ignore the contracted union to the Duke of Armagnac's daughter. Grafton wrote that Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, protector of the realm, repugned and resisted as much as in him lay this new alliance and contrived matrimony, alleging that it was neither consonant with the law of God nor man, nor honourable to a prince, to infringe and break a promise or contract. Baker wrote of the problems that this match created for Suffolk. In the meantime, the Earl of Suffolk, one of the commissioners for the peace, takes upon him beyond his commission and without acquainting his fellows to treat of a marriage between the King of England and a kinswoman of the King of France, niece to the French Queen, daughter to René, Duke of Anjou, styling himself King of Sicily and Naples, in which business he was so inventive that it brought an aspersion upon him of being bribed. It was soon to be revealed that due to the poverty of Margaret's father, not only was there no dowry for the marriage, but Suffolk and the King had agreed to hand a quarter of England's territory in France back by ceding Maine and Anjou. For his part in the arrangements, William was further elevated as Marquis of Suffolk. After the death of John, Duke of Bedford in 1435, and the emergence of Henry VI's personal distaste for fighting, the campaign in France had ground to a halt, frequently deprived of funding and commitment. It is possible that this situation led to Suffolk's negotiation, Marriage to Margaret of Anjou, a niece of the French King Charles VII, would bring the peace that Henry craved. Giving back Maine and Anjou would sweeten the deal and might also have been intended to make English territory in France more manageable. 
If that was the intention, it was to fail spectacularly. The effect of the handover of the vast tracts of land was to embolden the French and lead them to seek to drive the English from France altogether. Suffolk was blamed for opening the door through which the English would be expelled from France so completely that within a few years only Calais remained in English hands. The king's uncle, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, died in 1447, with many believing that he had been murdered at the Queen's behest. Gloucester had been protector during Henry's minority, and his loss saw the end of an era as the last son of King Henry IV passed. Suffolk, it seems, stepped into the void quite willingly, but suspicion grew all about him. By 1448, William had been created Duke of Suffolk, reaching the pinnacle of the nobility and attaining a title previously reserved for princes of the royal blood. His ascendancy was complete, and that brought him enemies. One anonymous writer tells how many now recollected how stoutly the Duke of Gloucester had stood up against the surrender of those provinces from which the King of France had made his attack. Further accusing Suffolk of plotting to get the English crown into his own family by marrying his infant ward, Lady Margaret Beaufort, to his own son, she being, they observed, the presumptive heiress of the Royal House of Lancaster, as long as the King had no children. William had married his son to the Beaufort heiress Margaret. Although the marriage was annulled by Henry in 1453, it drew accusations that by promoting Margaret as the potential heir to the throne, while Henry remained childless, he was seeking to see his son made King. The unlikely scenario of her accession, though, suggests that the attraction may have been the same financial one that saw Edmund Tudor marry her soon after the annulment. By 1450, Suffolk was unable to fend off the charges of treason any longer. He was accused of meeting with the French in an attempt to have England invaded. Baker wrote that he had traitorously incited the Bastard of Orléans, the Lord Presigny and others to levy war against the King to the end that thereby the King might be destroyed and his son John, who had married Margaret, daughter and sole heir of the John Duke of Somerset, whose title to the crown he said the Duke had often declared, in case King Henry should die without issue, might come to be King. Henry could no longer protect his favourite, and even the indomitable Queen could not save him. He was arrested and charged with treason. In front of Parliament, a long list of charges were laid before him, each of which he denied fervently, but his defiance was never going to prevail. At this point, Henry intervened on behalf of his favourite, exercising his prerogative to deal with the matter personally in the same way as Richard II had intervened on behalf of the Duke's grandfather. Henry refused to find Suffolk guilty of treason, but found against him on some other more minor charges. Henry sentenced Suffolk to banishment for a period of five years, beginning on the 1st of May 1450. As he tried to move to his London home, Suffolk was mobbed in the streets. Driven from London by the furious crowds, he retired to his manor at Wingfield. His son John was now eight years old. William, fearing that he would miss the formative years of his only son, wrote him a letter before he left which is filled with the kind of fatherly advice that Shakespeare's Polonius was to employ. He counselled John as follows. My dear and only well-beloved son, I beseech our Lord in heaven, the maker of all the world, to bless you and to send you ever grace to love him and to dread him, to the which as far as a father may charge his child, I both charge you and pray you to set all your spirits and wits to do and to know his holy laws and commandments, by which he shall with his great mercy pass all the great tempests and troubles of this wretched world, and also that wittingly you do nothing for love nor dread of any earthly creature that should displease him, and whereas any frailty maketh you to fall, beseech his mercy soon to call you to him again, with repentance, satisfaction and contrition in your heart, never more in will to offend him. Secondly, next him, above all earthly things, be a true liegeman in heart, in will, in thought, in deed, unto the King, our elder, most high and dread sovereign Lord, to whom you and I be so much bound, charging you, as father can and may, rather to die than to be contrary, or to know anything that were against the welfare and prosperity of his most royal parity, of his most royal person, but that so far as your body and life may stretch, you live and die to defend it, and to let his highness have knowledge thereof, in all the haste you can. Thirdly, in the same wise, I charge you, my dear son, always as you be bounden by the commandment of God to do, to love and to worship your lady and mother, and also that you obey always her commandments, and to believe her counsels and advices, in all your works, the which dread not, but shall be the best and truest for you. And if any other body would steer you to the contrary, to flee that counsel in any wise, for you shall find it naught and evil. Furthermore, as far as father may and can, I charge you in any wise to flee the company and counsel of proud men, of covetous men, and of flattering men the more especially, and not to draw nor to meddle with them, with all your might and power, and to draw to you and to your company good and virtuous men, 
and such as be of good conversation and truth, and by them shall you never be deceived, nor repent you of. Moreover, never follow your own wit in any wise, but in all your work of such folks as I write above, ask advice and counsel, and doing thus, with the mercy of God, you shall do right well, and live in right much worship, and great hearts rest and ease. And I will be with you, as good Lord and Father as mine heart can think. And last of all, as heartily and as lovingly as ever Father blessed his child on earth, I give you the blessing of our Lord, and of me, which in his infinite mercy increase you in your virtue and good living, and that your blood may by his grace from kindred to kindred multiply in this earth to his service, in such wise as after the departing from this wretched world here, you and they may glorify him eternally amongst his angels in heaven. Written of mine hand, the day of my departing from this land, your true and loving father, Suffolk. With that, Suffolk took ship to head into exile on the 1st of May 1450, the date appointed for the beginning of his five-year expulsion. As his boat crossed the channel, a ship of the Royal Fleet, the Nicholas of the Tower, intercepted him. William Lomner wrote to John Paston on the 5th of May that men of the Nicholas boarded Suffolk's ship, and the master bade him welcome traitor, as men say. He described Suffolk's fate, continuing, And then his heart failed him, for he thought he was deceived, and in the sight of all his men he was drawn out of the great ship and into the boat. And there was an axe and a stoke, and one of the lewdest of the ship bade him lay down his head, and he should be fair fared with, and die on a sword, and took a rusty sword, and smote off his head within half a dozen strokes. It was an ignominious end for a duke, a man whose family had risen in four generations, from merchants to the height of England's nobility. Perhaps the only consolation that William could have taken was that his son seemed to have heeded his words, John became second Duke of Suffolk and has been nicknamed the Trimming Duke, perhaps for his ability to trim his sails to suit the prevailing political winds. He married a sister of the Yorkist King Edward IV and lived into the Tudor era without ever finding himself in any real trouble. It was not to last though. John's son, the Earl of Lincoln, was appointed heir to Richard III and rebelled unsuccessfully against Henry VII, losing his life at the Battle of Stoke in 1487. Another son, Edmund, third Duke of Suffolk, took up the course of the White Rose. He was imprisoned by Henry VII in 1502 and finally executed by Henry VIII in 1513. Edmund's youngest brother, Richard de la Pole, continued the fight from the continent until he was killed fighting at the Battle of Pavia in 1525, much to the delight of Henry VIII. The brother between Edmund and Richard, Sir William Pole, holds a most dubious record. He was imprisoned in the Tower of London in 1502 and remained there for 37 years until his death in 1539. No one else has remained imprisoned in the Tower for longer in all of its history. It is hard to determine whether William, Duke of Suffolk, acted out of greed or well-meant service, doing what he determined was best in spite of the consequences. As with most things, I suspect that the truth lies somewhere in the space between these two extremes. His letter to his son has been cited as proof of his good character, yet a man can be a father, a warrior and a politician without any of these facets overlapping. There is no room for the contemplative adviser of his letter on the field of battle, Yet I suspect that a man would need something of a warrior about him to survive the politics of Henry VI's court, particularly if his background allowed others to sneer upon him. William de la Pole, first Duke of Suffolk, stood at the apex of his family's power. It took four generations of work to get to where he was. In two further generations, the family was destroyed. As his empty eyes stared out across the channel toward the land where his fortune had been made, he would never again look upon the country that had turned its back upon him, nor would he see the bitter civil war that was to follow. His space was swiftly filled by Edmund Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, and it is this, and the conflict it was allowed to breed, that lays the blame for the fate of so many at the clasped, praying hands and bowed head of the Lamb of England, King Henry VI. War was on that horizon that William gazed upon without seeing. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Wars of the Roses podcast. 